What would you do if you knew you had the opportunity to witness a paranormal phenomena? What if a hovering spacecraft dashed towards you without any hesitation? Why was a rural town in Canada a UFO hotspot for two years? Today, we test the believability of Charlie Red Star. to Believing the Bizarre, where we dive into the unknown and the unusual, and tell you whether or not we find it believable. That is right, it's another Tuesday, and it is alien time again. I do, you, you said it off the air, aliens again? It's been a minute, a little minute. I do feel like I keep robbing them from you though, but yeah, that's okay. I couldn't do a cryptid and I didn't want to do a haunting. I've so. never heard of this. Never heard, no. a lot of people haven't. I'm excited. It's this Can- is cool. It's, it's Canadian, so that's it's probably- got my name. It does have your name. I'll be honest. And, and I have no shame in saying this. Like the San Antonio, not San Antonio, the Detroit thing in Atlanta. I was reading a source that was talking about this. And it was like, one of North America's greatest UFO stories. And I was like, nah, man, this takes place in Canada. Oh, oh. Yeah, and then a few seconds later, I hated myself. <laughs> You're like, oh. <laughs> well. I, well, I could have kept it to myself, though, and I didn't. I wanted you all to know about that misery. <laughs> but you know what's cool about this? I always used to think I was ignorant, and I used to always think aliens only like the Southwest, like the New Mexico's and the Arizona's mm-hmm. and stuff like yeah. that. But now that we do these episodes, you know what I mean? Like we're talking about Montana, mm-hmm. we're talking about Canada, we were talking about Michigan. Like they like they like seasons too. <laughs> they do, yeah. So you're not familiar with Charlie Red Star. No, I'm not. Not. I wonder if we get into it, I'll be like, oh, maybe that draws my memory. But I, right now, I can't think of it. Okay. It does have your namesake, so you kind of should know about it. I wonder, where in Canada is this? It's in Manitoba. Manitoba. Yeah, um, which we'll get to. It's like central Canada. Oh, right in the middle there. Right by Montana. Yeah, well, kind of. I wrote I wrote the states that it's right above. It was in Montana. It's okay. close. All right. It's, uh, it's technically above North Dakota and Minnesota. Oh, okay. Because I knew you'd ask. <laughs> I would never I just know like, that. I just like being able to place it on a map. For sure, for sure. And and since you kind of transitioned for me, let's talk about Manitoba for just a second. Sure. Uh, it's small. It's quiet. It's rural, mostly agricultural. Uh, based on the source that I saw when I was reading it, could have changed. You know, it's crazy. Right now, there's like over 7 billion people. In the 90s... There were like 5 billion people. Yeah, there's now, a lot more. Now, I know the 90s now is like 30 years ago, which yes. is crazy. The 90s will always be 10 years ago. The 80s will always be 20 years ago. And the 70s will always be 30 years ago. For me. It's not true anymore. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. But at the time of reading the source, it was around like 3,000 or so residents. So agricultural, small, rural barns cows the cows have maple leaves on them instead of spots that's how they get branded with yeah yeah they're like hey <laughs> <laughs> they they probably still say moo very much like hamilton montana right if you ask me rural and this is not to like spoiler alert but i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little bit of a spoiler alert this is a pretty chill ufo encounter story thing like it's not malevolent it's kind of like little little UFO on the prairie. Oh, okay. Charlie the friendly UFO. Imagine a gray with like a dress on. Yeah. Well, like the hills are oh, alive. Oh, the, oh, the sound of music? Yeah. Is that the wrong pl- movie? Yes. Oh, it's it's well. very wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't like the sound of music, so we can trash it if you want. I've never seen it. But before we get to the main story, I do want to say my main sources are Mysterious Universe and CBC.ca, which if you couldn't tell by the .ca, it's a Canadian news site. Ah. So, let's begin. So the story about Charlie Red Star in Manitoba, Canada begins around February of 1975. Again, like I've said before, multiple times in the past... I really feel like alien sightings were bumping around the 70s, the 60s. Like, they just, like, they came, they saw what they needed to see, 
They're not repeat vacationers. UFOs. Right. They go there like one time. And like, they're like, I saw it. They have a bucket list. They're like, all right, Mercury, skip Earth, go to Venus, come to Earth, see it for a couple decades. They're like, all right, I saw it. Yeah, they're not like me in Disney World. Who would have known if they would have waited? <laughs> That's true. You go to Disney World every year. <laughs> it's not going to change, bro. <laughs> Actually, they did just get a whole they Star Wars. They got a big yeah. Star Wars thing. Yeah. No, no. Although imagine, I feel like m- not much probably changed between the 50s and the 70s. And I could be very wrong, but I feel confident saying that. But I feel like if they came back now, they'd be like, whoa. Yeah. Wow. New York um, is crazy. iPhones, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they would see that. Would they see that? If they steal somebody that has yeah. an iPhone. Like brown stuff. Like Androids are terrible. <laughs> so our story with Charlie Red Star begins with a normal, everyday farmer chilling by his barn. Because remember, he's in Manitoba. It's rural. He's going about his business, milking cows. No shirts overall on. Absolutely. Yes. Straw in mouth, growing corn, supplying giant eagle. When he sees a bright red light in the sky that he said looked like a ball. Now, I don't know about you, but this already is giving me major Antonio Villas-Boas vibes. Because one, you got a farmer. And yep, two, yep. he also saw a red light in the sky. Yes, he did. Now, this is... Is this in the evening? Do we say a time? It doesn't say a time. Okay. But it feels like the evening to me. Okay. <laughs> that feels like that's the time that you're out and about milking cows and stuff. So just giving it the eye test, the farmer estimated that the red light was about 14 to 18 inches in diameter. And it was swooping down and flying around and it flew directly at his head. But while the red light flew over his head, it didn't hit him. It went over his head. He said it emitted a searing almost painful heat and beyond that he actually felt the red light affect him physically he began to feel drowsy and a bit disoriented during the time that he could see the red light and after a few moments the red light shot directly into the sky and out of the farmer's sight it was only 18 inches you're small dude that i know listen this is great you're having the same reactions i was it's like wait a minute (laughs) that's tiny yeah are these like little baby aliens yeah i know like it's like people think they're seeing orb ghosts yeah and they're aliens they're charlie it's charlie like the little gray like the little thing in men in black that's piloting the the man suit like i know that was on in the hotel room (laughs) uh, in loveland but i i I didn't actually watch it that's from the first one you don't remember that no Okay, there's like a little guy inside in the, like the little head of yeah. the guy that dies. Yeah. And he's like, the galaxy is on Orion's belt. Oh, I remember him. And yes. the cat. Ah, spoiler alert. Yes, Orion is the cat. I remember, I think it's the second one. Maybe it's the second one. Yeah, it's the second one where Will Smith's like, it's raining black people in New York. That was That's the first? No, no. No, that's the first one. Are he you jumps sure? Into the bus. Yeah, I thought the bus was with the big worm fight from no, the no, second no. one. No, no, it's in the beginning of the first one because he jumps into the ah, okay thing. Yeah, that I, makes sense. I've seen the first one way more than I've seen any of the other ones. So yeah, it I makes saw the sense. third one on a date, dude. <laughs> this is this is a this is a tangent. The when they're fighting and he just hits the little girl because he's arguing. Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> So this farmer's encounter, this nameless farmer everyday encounter, was the first of many red light sightings, which ended up actually being very frequent in the area. Some spectators claimed that the small red light had almost a playful feel to it, as it would quickly fly towards people, but then dart away and hide, like it was almost playing a game. Like tag, or now you see me, now you don't. But with aliens... And on the other hand, other folks near Manitoba, Canada reported seeing flying objects that look like more what we would expect as a traditional UFO, like a flying saucer type craft. Like a Python, Python. drone, like with the little domey thing on top. Yeah. However, when they'd see this flying saucer, it would often be accompanied with red orbs surrounding it. So it's kind of like a blend of things that we've already talked about between these red orbs in the sky versus traditional crafts. Yeah. So how is this landing for you with like the combination of them both? Like you got a red light, you also have some of the traditional crafts, and some people are seeing them together all in this small rural area in Canada. It makes me think that the saucer is like a mothership or just like a ship that has the actual aliens. Yeah. And then the red lights are like some kind of drone thing. Yeah. They're just playing. It's like Mario Kart for them. Yeah. Well, it's like a camera. They're like. It could be a camera. Or some kind of visual thing. Hold on to that thought, because I want to bring that back up. Okay. Also, I like this designation of, okay, what are they calling it? Orbs. 
which blew my mind in the Hamilton Lights episode when we, they were getting discussed as red orbs in the sky rather than lights yeah. or crafts or anything. Mm-hmm. Like, we got that again. So I like the callback. Listen, I'm just going to reference every episode <laughs> that I can. But now let's move on to another sighting. So on March 27th of the same year, 1975, a young girl was alerted out of her sleep in the middle of the night by a loud, piercing sound coming from outside. It was reported to sound like a screaming siren. What about her parents? What about her parents? Do they not hear anything? Do they not care? They probably don't even exist, okay? She oh. doesn't, listen, she doesn't have a name. <laughs> oh. I, I don't know what kind of red flags you oh. need. <laughs> Sorry to go through the fourth wall about the story, <laughs> but homegirl doesn't got a name. Oh, all right. But if she was real, she sat up in her bed, confused and a little freaked out, by the sound that she had just heard outside. She's then, like, what am I? <laughs> What's even real? <laughs> but then she claimed that the entire house began shaking like a massive earthquake was happening. So she rushes to the window, which, may I interject, is exactly what you should not do during an earthquake. But what she saw outside confirmed that it was absolutely in the paranormal realm and not an earthquake. She saw a blazing red ball of light fly by her window, which flooded her room with a bright light and emitted so much heat, so much heat that she actually thought it started a fire in her house. That's hot. That's like you've been to Disney. You've been to Universal. <laughs> when they, when you're at the Jaws and the boat and they shoot at Jaws and things explode and yeah. you feel the heat, mm-hmm. that's what I thought of. Wow. Yeah. See, I'm tying a lot of knots. It flew up and it flew over her house, but then it flew back down and it hovered by her window for a few moments. She said when it came down, it was literally almost as bright as the sun. Wow. And then a few seconds later, it flew off in the distance, illuminating the ground underneath it as it went. So the next month in April, there was a couple at a private airfield near their rural farm in Carmen, Manitoba. That witnessed the unusual red light, except compared to all these other stories that we've mentioned thus far in this episode, they were willing to put their name on wax. This farm belonged to Bob and Elaine Dimert. Oh, they have money. Or Demert. Well, it's one of those two. We're going to call them Bob and Elaine. Okay. Bobby and Elaine, Robert. While they were walking around the private airfield, they saw what looked like a large red light slowly moving as it hovered above the tree line not too far away from their location. Cautiously and curiously, they approached the red light. As they got closer, they saw that it wasn't just a random ball of light, that it actually looked disc-shaped and had a dome attached to it. The red glowing disc hovered for another few minutes, and Bob and Elaine noticed that it, the light, the red light, was almost pulsating. Then the disc darted directly at them, but stopped suddenly and veered away and flew above the treetops. While they were shocked in that moment, this initial sighting near Bob and Elaine's farm turned into a regular occurrence for them. It was so consistent to the point that other folks in the area began showing up so that they could also see this red light themselves. Kind of like Hamilton Lights, right? I was going to say, the consistent, yes. the consistency reminds me of the Hamilton Lights. It's like, you know when you're in a video game and you see a part on the map and you're like, God, it looks cool, but it's like, there's only one way in and you can't get it. Like, you don't have the key yet or yeah, it's yeah, locked. Yeah. And then you have to do other stuff to learn how to fight or to do this or to do that. And then once you've learned that, then the, that part of the, the game opens up. Yeah. I feel like we needed to do all these other stories to get to Charlie Red Star. You know what's so weird? That really works. That analogy really works. I know exactly what you mean. There's a section of people in this world that listen to this episode that will not (laughs) feel like that resonated with them. What are you talking about? And I'm sorry, but that's perfect. Yeah, that's really good. I'm sorry. I, it just, there's so, and maybe this is just going to keep happening more and more the longer we do the podcast, because I've said it once, I said it again, I'm learning 
on the fly a lot like some of you are not obviously there's the mothman episodes there's specific episodes jersey devil where a lot of people come into these already knowing a good deal hopefully you leave knowing a little bit more than you came in with but at the same time when i'm researching or when charlie's presenting i'm learning yeah and i try to compound this information because something that might start out initially a skeptical but then the more we dive into other experiences around the world and we find out things are a lot more similar than you think it makes you look you look back and you're like wow i guess that wasn't that far-fetched yeah i mean i not I'm, saying I'm that the that. hamilton lights was far-fetched but just that's just an example but I do want to ask you this, because this is just reference land. This should just be a reference episode where we just, you know. That's <laughs> I think it, it is. It, it it has been, yes. But in the Hamilton Lights episode, I asked you what it would take to pull you away from seeing something paranormal. Yeah. It was, you know, mm-hmm. you, I was like, if there was a good movie on or a TV show on and it was so consistent, you've seen it a million times, would you stop? So this time I'm going to ask you on the flip side, if you knew that there was a paranormal phenomenon happening consistently like not guaranteed that you might show up it might not happen how far would you be willing to travel to experience this paranormal phenomenon probably a good couple hours <laughs> a couple of hours okay so how within, far would you go i don't know would i don't know present me a consistent paranormal phenomenon <laughs> we'll find out and we will see we'd have to get a passport for this though yeah we would we would let's start with montana and then we'll go from there. Can I just say something really quick? Absolutely. You describe Bob and Elaine. Elaine, yeah. For Robert. some reason, yeah. I I put you and Claire <laughs> as them. Like I could see you being that couple. Yeah. Like like you kind of like approaching and Claire with her wine glass. Like I don't know. Tyler. I'm not sure what this is. <laughs> that's not how. She, that's not how my wife. Does. No. <laughs> that's not a good. Rep- it's not a good representation, but. I will say this, though. I would never, ever, ever be a farmer. No, 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 no. Not for me. And and more power to the people that are farmers, but that's not my lifestyle. But back to the Charlie Red Star. So again, due to its consistency of showing up again and again and Bob and Elaine telling folks and asking them to come check it out for themselves to witness this amazing phenomenon, more and more people started coming. And again... Like I said earlier, even though we have examples by unnamed folks that might or might not be real where they talk about heat and pain, for the most part, this did not inspire fear. People did not see Charlie Red Star and be like, oh my God, I'm terrified. It was playful. They said it was a playfulness to it. Like it was playing a game. It was consistent. It was small. It wasn't anything they were afraid of. And almost to me, it feels, and it was never said that like this, this is just how I feel. It feels almost like going to see a circus. Like you're going to see something bizarre it might kind of blow your mind. It might not make sense. You might not want to get too close, but you're not afraid. Wait, pause. The thing's name is Charlie Red Star? Well, we're getting to that, but yeah. Okay. Because I was like, when are we going to get to the guy named Charlie Red Star? Listen, exciting? listen. That is probably my least favorite thing about this episode. And, uh, and I'll get to it when I get to it. Okay. So while these people are gathering and watching it and, you know, it's still, it hovers, it shoots back and forth, it darts at you, but then it backs away and it hides. One thing that a lot of people noticed about it was that it was very jagged in its motions and it wasn't like perfectly upright. Like it wasn't a very fluid UFO. Now when it flew in the sky, like it would, you know, dart off into the night. Mm-hmm. Then it was pretty fast and it was bright and it was like, look at me, I'm gone. But when it was just kind of floating around the treetops in the distance, It was at like, kind of like being, it was bobbing. Like a lot of people said it was bobbing up and down. It never was just like something smoothly, elegantly floating. I don't know if that means anything or not to you. I'm just, you know, but no, thinking about that, what if that has something to do with it being a drone? Like it's not a craft flying on its own. It's somebody controlling it. No, and I think that makes total sense. I The fact that it's so small, I, I don't think there's something inside of it. I think it's being controlled. Yeah, I got you. And that's totally fair. It's funny. I was imagining like all these people gathered around this, this field watching this beautiful red light do like a synchronized dance and everything. And then there's just this one guy in the back with a shotgun. He's just like, bam. <laughs> and then it falls down. He's like, get off my damn airfield. <laughs> that's my favorite. Right. I joke. But again, like I said, everybody really liked this UFO. It was friendly. And everybody was down with that. So due to its growing popularity, it was around this time that this red glowing orb got its name, Charlie Red Star. 
I don't know why. I, I literally spent an hour trying to find every keyword and phrase to find out why they decided to call it Charlie Red Star. My, the only thing I came to, the only conclusion I came to is that they liked it. It's a name of the time. And it was just like, oh, that's good old Charlie. Look, guys, it's Charlie. I don't think it's not named after somebody. It's not named after people that found him. Unless my research is way off. And I'll get to this way later. But there is a guy who witnessed it and wrote a book. He kind of sat on it for like 50 years. But he wrote a book that came out, I think, in 2017. May I didn't get a chance to read it. Maybe there's something in there. But there was no clear cut. Well, they called it Charlie Red Star because I don't think it was like one person did it. I think it was kind of a collective thing. Like it's just like somebody said it and over time without rhyme or reason, it just became known for that. And obviously when you get to newspapers and media, they want a a title, a tagline, a name. You know what I mean? So it became Charlie Red Star. Maybe it comes from, have you ever heard of the phrase good time, Charlie? Yeah, I've never used it like that. I'm having a good time. Charlie. No, no, like he's a good time Charlie. Oh, like this is a good time. I'm having fun. Is that am I using it? No, like like use in a sense. John has a lot of fun at parties. He's a good time Charlie. Oh, okay. So it's describing somebody's behavior. It's like a title. Okay, he's a good time Charlie. Like don't be a Debbie Downer. I'm not a good time Charlie at parties. <laughs> I'm a hang in the back and try not to talk to as many people as I can, Chucky. So one particular person that came to observe Charlie Red Star was Ian Nicholson, a Royal Canadian Mounted oh. Police Constable. All right. It's a mouthful. It's an inflated title. That's an intense job. Yeah. They're an intense guy. They're You know horses. he's on a horse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're right. Yeah. Uh-huh. No Kelpies in here. No. I'm going to do a ding every reference. So he wanted to see I'm the not phen- doing that. it's too much work. <laughs> he wanted to see the phenomenon for himself, which he described as an oval red light surrounded with an X-shaped white halo. He was quoted as saying, quote, I sat there two or three minutes just looking at this object, which appeared stationary at the time. Then I decided to get a closer look at it. I drove west. And I can say I was moving pretty fast. On his horse. <laughs> no. As I was going west, the object seemed to be flying in a northeasterly direction. I continued approximately 12 miles, keeping the object in sight, trying to get somewhat abreast of it, so that if the opportunity presented itself, I could have driven north toward it. About 16 miles west of Carmen, I stopped the car. I'd seen there was no way I was going to be able to catch up to it, so I just stopped the car and watched the object go out of sight over the tree line on the horizon. Unquote. That reminds me of Pennsylvania Chase, Ah, or Chase the Pennsylvania Border. I have that in here somewhere, but I'll give you the ding for that one. Also, I just want to reiterate again, Carmen is in Manitoba. Okay. We're still in Manitoba here. So meanwhile, the popularity of Charlie Red Star grew to the point that it was legitimately causing traffic jams as so many people were trying to drive out to this rural airfield area to witness this amazing event. Traffic jam like I just experienced. Oh yeah, it took Charlie two hours to get to my house today and it only takes 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So people that you would assume would want to keep their credibility intact, like Canadian law enforcement and pilots, were among the folks that said it was real without a doubt. Wow. Interesting way of phrasing it. Because obviously I don't just, I'm not just reading the article. I spin it. Right. It's like they're trying to make it seem like people you wouldn't expect to lie. And I mean, well, I'm not going to make the joke. You know, you know the joke. I'm not going to make the joke. But I think what they're trying to say is like not people that are naturally trustworthy, but people that if you kind of like we were talking about the UFO chase to the Pennsylvania border, the fact that they're cops and they're saying they saw this UFO, it would hit their credibility for lying. There's no good reason to make it up. You have nothing to gain. So. Roger Pitts, an airline pilot, witnessed the red orb, and he had this to say, quote, it was flying on a 45 degree angle, but it was flying straight at us. As we watched, it didn't turn around. It just went directly the other way, straight away from us. It just went off into the distance away, and a puff of smoke appeared, an odd shape, like a small cloud, and it disappeared in that. Unquote. Smoke. It's got like the Batman, like a 
Yeah, like a like a like a ninja, just like pshh. yeah. No, I, but it's weird. What's weird is that there's underlying factors in every sighting that is familiar, like pretty much circular red light. Mm-hmm. But then there's also like X white halo, yeah, that's searing weird. red pain, puff of smoke. You know, yeah. it's like there's also. I'm not saying that they're different things. This is all classified pretty much as the one thing, the Charlie Red Star. But, you know, I'm not saying, you know, you're allowed to have some variations. You know, it's not a bad thing to mix it up every now and then. What if, what if they're all different drones that do different things from the same ship? Okay, so it's all owned, it's all the same property of the mothership. Yes. But it's like, this is my puff of smoke red drone. Yeah, this is the one that disappears in smoke. This is the one that has the weird glow that does the other thing. This is the one I broke on Venus, so it kind of flies at an angle. <laughs> I mean, it still gets the job done. Yeah. Oh, another theory. What if these red b- lights are red because where they're from, they don't have a blue sky, they have a red sky. So they don't blend in here, but at other places they might be able to hide and yeah, blend in. Yeah, almost in plain sight. Do you think they need to hide where they're from? I think you could always find a precedent to hide. Like uh, an animal playing dead. Some are just better than others. Well, I, I mean, okay, maybe maybe it just it fits their atmosphere better. No, that's fair. And maybe like the pressure here in gravity is why it's flying at a 45 degree angle where elsewhere, like in space, mm-hmm. it can fly upright. Yeah, it was, it was just a thought I had. No, 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 I like it. I, it may, it's almost creepy to think about why they might have to hide in their, their planet and maybe why they left. Yeah. Maybe it's a constantly warring planet. Yeah. Maybe they're spies. Dinosaurs. What? The- <laughs> so, <laughs> now that we got pilots and people like that seeing it, naturally, with all of this hoopla, you're going to attract the big bad media. So on May 11th, a local, and this is all the same year, 1975, a local TV crew, a local (laughs) TV crew, a local TV news crew comprised of Bill Kendricks and John Barry, doesn't matter, you don't know who they are, arrived to the area to see if they could film Charlie Red Star with the ultimate goal of really making it look like they didn't capture it on a potato because it's in the 1970s (laughs) and just trying to figure out what the heck this thing is. Well, For two days, they got absolutely nothing. Just a single light in the sky, which they quickly dismissed as a normal airplane. How pissed was their producer? (laughs) He's like, we'll go in one day. We'll be back the next day. We'll get it up and out. You know, he's putting out money for the hotel room and the news guys just like, now this is great. I hope he never shows up. (laughs) I I would be pissed, though. I oh think. yeah. Well, it depends. They make it seem like it's literally an everyday thing, but we're also talking about months. That's like it true. could be a twice a week thing. Who knows? Charlie's got shit to do. <laughs> but two days later, on May thirteenth, they finally got what they were looking for. Bill set out towards the private airfield again, and this time he brought with him film technician Alan Kerr and newspaper editor Howard Bennett. Not long after arriving. They witnessed a red orb rise from the tree line, flash bright and brilliantly, and then shoot directly into the sky within just a couple of seconds. The men were awestruck and were silent for a few minutes, completely stunned about what they just witnessed. Eventually, they dispersed, and that's when the red orb returned. The newspaper editor, Howard, was quoted with saying, Quote, I could see this big glow behind some trees less than a half a mile away, off to the right, and then ahead of us. It was smoky red, a hazy glow, and to me, the thing was higher than the trees, maybe 50 feet tall. It was about 20 feet thick and was sitting at an angle of about 45 degrees. The edges were fuzzy and not sharply defined. It it was much like seeing a drive-in movie screen from the side, unquote. Again, with the 45 degrees, yeah, much bigger. What do you think about this haziness? Like, it's not a clear cut. Like, it's 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 a orb, a red light, like maybe like a halo. That's not defined. And I think that's a very interesting analogy 
Like you're looking at a drive-in movie screen from the side. It makes me think of interdimensional travel rather than space travel. For some reason, it was making me think hologram. Mm. Like it's not really there. I thought like some kind of bleed through Mm -hmm. rather than traveling. Like it's here, but it's not all the way here. Yeah. I got you. There was absolutely no 1080 (laughs) back in the 70s. No. Or HDMI. No. So Bill and Alan saw it too, and they described it like seeing a blood red moon that was just hovering and bouncing up and down through the trees. And they also noted that it was completely silent. It made no noise whatsoever. Alan, the technician, was able to capture a few moments of footage of the red object as it flew overhead. But because of the technology, how late it was, the fact that the, even with their eyeballs, they said it wasn't sharply defined. It simply looks just like a red light in the sky. Not the most conclusive evidence. But I will say that I, th- I think it's evidence of something. You know what I mean? Like, even if the picture isn't concrete, something was there. Maybe. I don't know. I, yeah, it's got to be something. Like, what else? I mean, what made that? Right. I yeah. don't know. And this is the 70s. So it's like, you got to believe technology isn't like, like nowadays, like you see a light in the sky and you're like, oh, is it a drone? Is it this? Is it, mm-hmm. you know, a jet? Is it military? Not that, you know, there was stuff happening in the 70s too, but I feel like now, y- you know, you don't get the benefit of the doubt now. You know, you're kind of, you're not UFO until proven UFO now. But I do have the picture if you want to see it. I do, yeah. So a few days after this event, the guys did return to the site with a radiation meter to test the areas they witnessed this event in, the red light in, to see if anything unusual would come up. Kind of like the Adelov Pass. Ding. They test their Geigers. <laughs> yeah. The Geiger counters. I don't know what that is. What are you talking the, about? It measures radiation. Yeah, I don't know. A Geiger is. counter. I don't know. It's don't just know. a funny word to me. I, it's a, I'll give you that. The Geiger. Geiger. I don't want to say it for some reason, though. I don't know what it could be mistaken as, but I don't <laughs> I don't like it. I mean, it's funny. I like you saying it. I don't want to say it. But unsurprisingly to the men, they found several spots with radiation anomalies. Oh. So to them, this was proof. This was the proof that their eyes needed to justify what they witnessed the previous night. There's a lot of radiation stuff with an episode I want to do in the future with an alien thing. What a tease. Can we give a future ding? And I'm no referencing like... episodes that haven't even happened yet. I know. Well, this is excellent. I know the story and I'm like, I, I'm, I'm tying knots before. Yes. You're like, what if we just like stopped your episode? Let's do Inception. <laughs> We're going to do a Believe in the Bizarre episode in and do what that'd be funny if we did that. Like we start the music that'd over again and funny. everything. If there were two things that tied together so perfectly, maybe we will do that. But as for Charlie Red Star, the sightings continued on June 4th of the same year. And we're back to a nameless, probably fake farmer <laughs> who was out and about in his field when he saw a massive glowing red disc with two domes, two domes, not one dome, two, probably up and down. I would assume. I think oh, it's top and bottom. I saw next to each other. I was like, it's those are boobies. <laughs> it's a buy one, get one. His, I think you're right though. Up and down. Yeah. His initial response which he must not have heard about Charlie Red Star. His initial response was fear, and he immediately ditched his farm and ran to his truck. I imagine he said, F- this, I'm out. <laughs> but as he put the key in his ignition, in true horror movie fashion, he turned, he turned, and he turned, but the truck's engine would not start. In his mind, he thought that the red spacecraft somehow sucked the energy out of his truck and stopped it from working properly, which is something that is often tied to alien, you know, encounters. Yeah. Or UFO encounters. I don't know how, but yeah. It takes a lot of power to fly those things and jig jag it in 45 degree angles. Well, I don't know suck how it, it from sucks that. it from cars. Yeah. The starting powder? Yeah. Powder? Powder. Powder. It's like an old gun. <laughs> I gotta get her started. <laughs> My notes say that or it's a Ford. Boom. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, Charlie wow. probably just wanted to hang out. He's like, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see your cows. I just watched um, Brady Bunch. I don't know. Weird. That's, okay. No, Three's Company. Okay. There you go. Well, what else was on in the 70s? Oh, um, I don't know. Family Ties? I think that's 80s. I don't know anything. What I do know is that on July 1st of the same year, a group of three friends saw a bright red orb hovering 
around a grain elevator, which I think is farm jogging for a shed. I don't know. (laughs) They described its general motions as erratic, not really having control or planning where it wanted to move. Now, I know we kind of already have that as a baseline, the way that it's bouncing. It's at a 45 degree angle. And I don't know if, I mean, everybody else is saying it's playful. I haven't seen it. I can't say. I don't, you know, I didn't get a feeling. I'm just reading these stories. But for some reason to me, erratic is like a buzzword for like wrong. Like it's Mm -hmm. almost creepy. Yeah. Like you would describe a demon possession as erratic. Yes. Like like the possession of Annalise Sting. Mm -hmm. But for me, what it made me think of for some reason, erratic, like it's kind of like jarring. Yeah. It's not moving properly. It made me think of when we were talking about like ghosts, mental state deteriorating, like in Resurrection Mm -hmm. Mary, ding. You are really doing references out the ass. Some of this is off the cuff. Some of it's in my notes. I'll okay. be honest. And now, obviously, I know that has nothing to do with this. It's just, it's what it made me think of. Uh huh. Which is interesting that words, different words can make you feel different things. Because technically, everybody's been saying this the entire time. It's not fluid. It bounces. It seems to be a little awkward. I'm like, oh, it's playful. It's cute. And then, you know, three kids unnamed, probably fake, say it's erratic. And I'm like, ugh. I have in my notes here. Plus, at this point, I'm just going to continue referencing every episode I can think of. <laughs> already, we already done, done it, done it, done it. I've we did like that saying bit. a thing and then not saying a thing and then saying it again. <laughs> and they'd be like, why is he saying that again? But anyway, back to the three friends. Eventually, the light landed in the field briefly before shooting off into the sky like Charlie do. One of the friends said, quote, it was about 85 feet in diameter. In perfectly round, so round it was unbelievable. It was saucer shaped, and the top and bottom traveled in different directions. The bottom one spun to the right, and the top one spun to the left. There was a center section that didn't move, about six to eight feet in width, and there was oval shaped windows in it. I'd say that there were about sixteen windows in the whole circumference, eight looking on the side that we were on, unquote. Now, that is, like, remarkably specific. Yeah, it is. Like, he's got the rotations down, but it's like, I can see it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I can see that one. That's more than just, like, a... But, okay, is this the same thing? We got out-of-focus, hazy red light. We yeah. got 14-inch red light. And now we got this thing, which he said 85 feet in diameter. Yeah, that's huge. It's That's big. If you take nothing else away from the episode, yeah, that's big. 85 feet is big. Yeah. No matter what anyone tells you. It's interesting that they're in Canada and they're using feet. That's a little sus, right? Huh? A little sus? Yeah. So the next day on July 2nd, another witness in the Manitoba area claimed that the red light landed in one of his fields, oh. which is a little bit of a flex. It's one of my fields. Oh, yeah. One I have of my many, many fields. fields. Yeah. Got but my soy fields and potato fields, my gluten-free field. My gluten-free field. <laughs> but not only that, he said that it significantly damaged his crops where it landed. Apparently, it left behind an oval patch of dead vegetation and tripod marks. So... For the rest of 1975 and for a good portion of 1976, good old, good time, Charlie Red Star became a well-known entity, attracting thousands of people to travel to the rural Canadian area to catch a glimpse of this extraterrestrial being. Some people, kind of like the, the, uh, the, it wasn't the constable, whoever was in the car chasing him, but you said it was probably, it was the constable because we joked about the horse. Yeah. Like him. Some people even got in their cars as soon as they left to try and chase it and see where it would go. However, eventually near the middle of 1976, out of nowhere and without warning, Charlie Red Star disappeared and never returned again. Imagine going the night after he's just gone forever, not knowing he was gone forever, <laughs> waiting to see it for the first time. It's like, you know, you, it's like you book your vacation out. Yeah. Like a year. And you're like, we're going to go see him in November. And... Nope. And you're just like, maybe it was me. What you just said, though, is a very real thing. And it can mean different things. But it's like, you never know when the last time you do something is going to be the last time. Unless it's like absolutely planned. Unless you plan it for the, to be the last time. Right. But like, you think about like, you know, 
everybody has their good old days or like things like that. Like even think about this. The last time, and this is, I'm talking to Charlie here. You, you guys can, you know, <laughs> check your phones or whatever. Like the last time that we ever really, really played rock band. Yeah. Was like the last time we ever played it and it'll be the last time. And it's like, but we didn't know it at the time that, you know what I mean? Like those little mm-hmm. things. It's like the last time that you were in a, a college musical or a college play was the last time. But it's like, you don't think about it, like, this is it. It's just like, it just happens. The last time we did improv, we didn't know. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just like, it's done. Mm-hmm. So that closes that chapter from that source on Charlie Red Star. Now I want to transition to the, the CDC dot CA, that, that new source. Oh, I was like the CDC. Not the, not that CDC. <laughs> it's it's uh, just news. It's just COVID? No. Since 1998, Stamps.com has been an indispensable tool for nearly 1 million businesses. Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS shipping right to your computer. Whether you're an office sending invoices, a side hustle Etsy shop, or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. All you need is a computer and a standard printer. No special supplies or equipment. Within minutes, you're up and running. Printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. And you'll get exclusive discounts on postage and shipping from USPS and UPS. Once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. No traffic, no lines. Cut the confusion out of shipping. With Stamps.com's new Rate Advisor tool, you can compare shipping rates and timelines to easily find the best option. Save time and money with Stamps.com. There's no risk. And with our promo code POD, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in POD, P-O-D. That's Stamps.com, promo code POD. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. So a little bit like the Hamilton Lights, I wanted to find some UF stories about Manitoba, Canada, unrelated to Charlie Red Star. But, you know, just I think it can add weight when you can bring in more sources that kind of back up, even if they're not exactly the same. Yeah. But it's a rural area and they're having these UFO experiences. So in 2014, there's this Canadian survey. It was a UFO UFOlogy research. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm. But still... They detailed that more than a thousand UFO cases are reported in Canada. And during the mid seventies, when we were talking about with Charlie Red Star, they claimed that that specific rural section of Canada was experiencing UFO sightings at five times the national average. And that's for the seventies. She was bumping in the seventies. So what they're saying is, is it seems like this really was a hot spot. It was experiencing a UFO flap. <laughs> is that is that what it's? Yes, that's what it's called. We talked about it before. That's right. You, we did. We the did. flap. You know what's a shame? There's not going to be a Canadian accent in this this episode. I'm not. That's one of the ones I'm not confident about. I don't have the. And I'm in not front of me. doing the don't you knows and the a's. Like get out of here. Just like a subtle Canadian Gossamos. accent. No. I no. I do recommend seeing Come From Away though the musical. About the in nine eleven. Oh yeah, you've recommended this land. before. Yeah, during this podcast or was it the other podcast? It was this podcast. Are you sure? Yeah, for nine eleven. All right. I thought that they. I didn't know it was Canada. Like the accents were so thick, and then the more I listened to, it, I was like, oh, that's Canada. And then it was Newfoundland, and it was. Yeah. But there's a great line where they say Dasamoose. <laughs> <sighs> so there's a lot of alien sightings here. All right, they're trying to get on that universal healthcare life. <laughs> 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 Times are tough flying around space. Asteroid saucer benders. That hit me from the left field. Oh my God, (laughs) that's funny. So apparently one of the earliest documented UFO encounters from this rural Canadian town happened in 1792. Not a typo. I'm not dyslexic. Charlie thinks he might be. This was a long time ago. So David Thompson and Andrew Davey were exploring the area when they witnessed what seemed like multiple meteorites, which is what happens when it enters the atmosphere. Larger than the moon. Larger than the moon. I'll say it one more time. Larger than the moon. I don't know what Davy, Davy, 
Well, that's his last name. Andrew and David. You can call him Davy. You can be Davy and Davy. I'm just <laughs> saying, if you wanted it to be. I don't know what they were doing, but they said larger than the moon had crashed into ice. Oh, wow. So let's take a peek into the first David. Davy squared. Their journal. Quote, it struck the river ice with a sound like a mass of jelly was dashed into innumerable luminous pieces and instantly expired. The next morning, we went to see what marks this meteor had made on the ice, but could not discover that a single particle was marked. Larger than the moon. <laughs> what? Are you <laughs> kidding me? I I think they mean... like It was big. Well, I don't think they mean like bigger than the moon. Like what they see of the moon. I know. Listen, I'm down for metaphors and that's okay. fine. It, you're right. It's what you see of the moon, which is like your thumbnail. Yeah. From a distance. Yeah, no, they they meant the physical moon. <laughs> it's big. We all died. So let's look at some other UFO-related reports. May 20th, 1967, okay. Stefan Mikulak was hanging out at Falcon Lake in Manitoba around noon. There you go. Here's a time frame. Okay. Noon. Only one. While he was enjoying the view of the lake, he saw a disc-shaped object land on a large, flat rock. He was freaked out, but... He didn't want to miss out on this encounter, so he hid and recorded the UFO Dover Demon style ding by sketching it out. He gathered a little bit of courage and he stepped out of his hiding spot and he approached the disc shaped object. He says he immediately heard two human like voices and was hit by burning hot gas. Oh, wow. Actually. Set his clothes on fire. What? But apparently not his sketchbook. Shit was made of metal. Wow. So apparently, because of that experience and the gas that was put upon him, he experienced weight loss, odd burn marks on his chest and stomach, charred hair, and a strange rash. How do I get hit with some of this gas? <laughs> I, I, tell me about it. For a few weeks after the incident, he reported reoccurring dizziness and... When the scene of the encounter was investigated by authorities, under the impression of an extraterrestrial contact, they did find radiation at the site. So moving on to March 4th, 1977. Mr. S, <laughs> which I can only assume stands for Mr. Sus, was, <laughs> was driving towards his farm near sundown when suddenly, about five meters directly in front of him, he saw a vibrant oval light in the sky that he described as shimmering and pulsating. It was completely silent, and it didn't seem to be solid, perhaps a hologram. He continued driving, dumbstruck by what he witnessed. But eventually, he came upon three, quote, people, quote, standing on the road in front of them. He said they looked about five feet or so tall and had the overall shape of bowling ball pins, they had bulbous heads, very slim necks, and a flared body similar to a skirt. Other than these descriptions, there were no other identifying features visible to Mr. S. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I'll let you be the judge, they popped up in front of him too quickly, and he wasn't able to hit the brake. Or maybe he didn't want to hit the brake. But regardless, as he clenched his teeth and he braced for impact... He never felt a thing. The three creatures seemed to completely vanish as soon as they touched his bumper. Fake or interdimensional? Uh, I don't Interdimensional. Okay, moving on. Wait, no. It's, oh, you want to talk about that one? Just really quick. You got shit to say? One thing. What's up? It sounds like the alien from, weirdly enough, American Dad. <laughs> Roger? Yeah. Doesn't it? The bulbous head? Yeah. No, I can see that. Yeah, weird. Anyway, that's all wow, I was Who would have thought of Roger reference? October 9th, 1989. Taylor Swift was born. <laughs> Around 2.50 p.m., a family was on a trip to Fort White Nature Center in Winnipeg when they witnessed a boomerang-shaped object flying around the sky. Only the parents had noticed the craft, so they yelled for the children to get in the car so they would not be scared and freaked out by the UFO. Once the kids were safely inside the vehicle, the parents watched as the object hovered 
slowly rotating. Let me ask you, would you, Charlie, be pissed if your parents told you years later when you're like 18 or 19 years old, yeah, you know, we saw a UFO, but we told you to go in the car so you didn't see it? No, because as a child, I would have... Literally peed my pants. Was you just blown up? You like, oh my god! <laughs> yes, <laughs> just explode. Yes. Oh, I've been so scared. Like they they said they yelled for them to get in the car, but they didn't want to be scared. Like how they yell, like get in the <laughs> car. car. <laughs> They're like scared for other reasons. They just throw them. <laughs> Shut the door. <laughs> Don't look out the window. That would be frightening. <laughs> it's probably more frightening than the UFO. Yeah. They're like, we didn't want you to see what we saw. The kids are like, what, the UFO? <laughs> <laughs> and then they swerved off traffic. Yeah. Now that's getting dramatic. November 1st, 1992. Around 2 a.m., a nurse in Winnipeg named Karen was awakened by a loud thud on her bedroom door. Not outside. Her bedroom door. So she got out of bed, made her way over to the door, and discovered two little creatures in her living room. They had massive round eyes, but that was the only defining feature, other than their long robe-like gowns, which were white. Once they noticed her standing there, they telepathically told her, that they want to take her for a ride in space. Next thing she knows, she's in a large hangar that contained a cigar-like craft. She and the two small aliens got in, and she immediately saw a main control room with multiple chairs, screens, and buttons. And once the little creatures started pushing and pushing the little buttons, suddenly on the screens, she saw what looked like endless stars. And a second later, she found herself back in her bedroom. Sorry, that really freaked me out. Did it? Yeah. I was trying to read you and I didn't know if you found it funny. No. Listen, I wonder why. Let's pretend this is real. I wonder why her, but also... It makes me think of Hillary Porter ding because we were talking about how abductions when she was saying abductions aren't always physical. Yeah. Sometimes they're mental, like the beach thing that she was talking about, Mm -hmm. but also interdimensional, like you've been kind of hinting at this entire episode where it's like, you know, an hour in our time can be seconds in their time or reverse where, you know, we're gone for seconds but you're really gone for hours. Like, there's no such thing as time. They bend time. So who knows how long she was really gone? Who knows what she doesn't remember? Or maybe they planted that in her head. Who knows? What, so what about that really freaked you out? Uh, the fact that they were in her living room already and the way they're described and dressed, I just know that my dog would have killed the one <laughs> and I would have actually shot the other one to death. With a little pew-pew? Oh, yeah. They, they <laughs> wouldn't, like, we want to... They, <laughs> I don't know what episode this is from. So, uh, and you know, when you have like, um, have you ever heard about like, if you have like funds that aren't direct deposit, but then you quit or you get a new job and there's kind of like left there, like unclaimed funds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this, like this ding is unclaimed because I don't remember what episode it's from. It's an unclaimed reference. It'll be out there just waiting. But there was an episode where I was talking about how your dogs do the 3d that finisher move. (laughs) Oh man. Oh, is it Goatman? Goatman. Reference, just like the Goatman episode. Your your uh, dogs, Apollo and Mars, gets those aliens in the 3D. Boom! Oh, they would they would destroy them. Like, they would be like, we come in and they just... <laughs> like, it's not like they're mean dogs, but they wouldn't let an intruder. Like, by God, that's Apollo's music. <laughs> Somebody stop the damn <laughs> match. Yeah. So those are a collection of UFO encounters in Manitoba that kind of supplement... The Charlie Red Star encounters and just showing you that the area, this area in Canada, maybe just all of Canada, this UFO hotspot. I do have one more little bit to add. Okay. A little caveat. Nuclear research facility. So the White Shell Laboratories, which is originally known as the White Shell Nuclear Research Establishment, was an atomic energy area. It was an atomic energy laboratory in Manitoba, northeast of Winnipeg, in Canada. Apparently, they tested 
nuclear waste disposal, and they even have an underground research laboratory. And I'm not saying it's like the hive in Resident Evil, but I'm also not saying that it's <laughs> not the hive in Resident Evil. And I do want to say, in 1974, just a year before Charlie Red Star started appearing, the ZEUS, which is an acronym for Zoological Environment Under Stress Experiment, tested longer radioactive releases and measured the results. Basically, they were trying to see effects of radiation and things with meadow voles, which are essentially field mice out in the prairies. Okay. The There were no conclusive results from their testing. Ew. And because it's about animals, I didn't go any further. But one, this could easily explain why the news team found radiation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could it explain UFOs? Could it have attracted them here? Oh, Oh, we, we'll get into that in the discussion. Well, there's just a little bit more. Okay. This is like, this is the call to action. If you want to learn more about this, I didn't get a chance to read it. I hinted at this near the beginning of the episode. But uh, a guy by the name of Grant Cameron actually experienced Charlie Red Star. Like, he was there. He was one of the people that would drive around. Like, him and his friends got together, and they saw it. And then his friends were like, that was cool. We're moving on. And he's like, no. This <laughs> no, is, we're not. This is life now. And he actually wrote this man- manuscript for this this book way back when. But then he's like, nobody's going to want to read it. I don't actually know why he hid it. But he put it away. And, it like, literally, he wrote it in the 70s. And I'm pretty sure it's published in the mid-2010s, like 2017. So it's just kind of been sitting around. But he goes into more sightings. He talks about tracking Charlie Red Star himself. So if you do find this very interesting, I would recommend checking that out. That's called Charlie Red Star, True Reports of One of North America's Biggest UFO Sightings, which, don't get it twisted, Canada is absolutely in North America. We welcome them them with open arms. But I do want to say this. I want to finish because it's tying into the nuclear stuff. Seems to be that he thinks that the Charlie Red Star had been drawn to the area because of the nuclear facility. And once missiles that were being stored there were removed around 1976, it coincided when Charlie Red Star disappeared. That makes total f***ing sense. Interesting coincidence. So, with all of that said, are you ready to go to the discussion? Yes, sir. So before we get to the discussion, now is the time that we love to thank our new patrons. We have three of them this week, so thank you so much to our new patrons as of the recording of this episode, Joseph, Joshua, and Marco. We appreciate you. We appreciate you enjoying the Bizarroist family and getting all the extra bonus content. We hope you enjoy it. Now, let me say this, because now's the time. We're like, we got quizzes and Netflix watch parties and interviews and director's cuts. Sounds like us. Yes, we do have all of that and more. But what have we not talked about in a hot minute? Listen, and it's kind of built into the, the platform. There's these things called goals. And they're like, you should make goals. And we're like, okay, that sounds healthy. We'll make some goals. Let me tell you about our next goal. Currently, as of the recording of this podcast, we're at 61 patrons. When we hit 75, we are going to buy a legitimate audio library. So those amazing sound effects that you hear and that heart-stopping, blood-boiling music that Charlie uses will only get better. But listen, that's at 75. What happens, and this could be forever from now, could be next month, could be a year, who knows. But even crazier, when we hit 200 patrons, Charlie, tell them what is going to happen. I'm going to get our logo ain't onto my skin forever. Is it officially the logo or is it just a Believe in the Bizarre tattoo? Like, could it be a not deer or does it need to be like our logo? I was thinking the logo, but that's open for interpretation, I think. Yeah, completely. It's totally fine. So... Are we far away from that? Kind of. But for the low price of $2 a month, you can help Charlie get a Believing the Bizarre tattoo. (laughs) I cannot wait. It's going to be so much fun. But seriously, thank you, everybody, for supporting us. Thank you, everybody, beyond that, for listening. We appreciate it so much. It keeps us inspired. It keeps us excited. And with all that said, let's head to the discussion. I like how you said it like it's a child in need. (laughs) 
All right, so there there's a lot happening in this. I don't I, I feel like it's too much just to go to like an overview. But what what are you latching on to the most here or what's resonating the most with you because there's so many different variations. And let's and let me say this. I think the nuclear facility is easily worth discussing, but kind of like when we went into those short snippets during the Hamilton lights episode i would leave those other encounters out this is mostly about charlie red star and i feel like it'll get really convoluted to add all that stuff into yeah. and a lot of it was nameless people like i appreciate them being very specific with the times <laughs> that they saw things but let's focus mostly on charlie red star and tie in some of the nuclear facility stuff so out of that breaking that down what resonates with you the most i was gonna say the nuclear facility um with their with their nuclear missiles being there and then when they move the thing disappears because there's a theory that when man cracked the the code of of you know the molecule splitting the atom splitting that's when aliens started to get really interested in us maybe again and then that's when those those sightings started to pick up so there's and there there's been connections between nuclear facilities and spaceships, like um, in the Hudson Valley, during the Hudson Valley sightings flap, there was a spaceship that was over a nuclear facility. I can't think of any more right now, but I, there's a connection between military bases and, and missiles and USO flaps. Do you think it's curiosity? Do you think it's them worried about us? Do you think it's them worried about us doing something to the universe? I think it's a, one, a curiosity, two, and you're right, a worry that this is the next step into us becoming a a threat or b an ally, and I, just, I really just, like that theory. We're just one atom split away from creating a black hole. You're like, guys, maybe <laughs> just stick to TikTok. That's cool. <laughs> you don't need to be splitting atoms. So I think that theory is really, really interesting with Charlie Red Star because maybe these drones are just checking in to to see what's going on it's possible and it is a major coincidence that as soon as they were moved it just disappeared that's huge so let's talk a little bit about what it is because there's kind of like two different sides to this it's either it is its own craft versus it's just a drone to a bigger another mother ship and i feel like i already kind of know where you're cut where you're at but I'll let you kind of reiterate on that a little bit more since we are here in the discussion. Sure. I'm convinced. I'm pretty convinced that the small ones are maybe different kinds of drones and everything bigger than, what was it, one, 84 feet or something? Yeah, 85 feet. Huge. That might be as some kind of ship with entities in it. Right. I agree because I think that AIDS, it complements the, the, the witnesses testimonies that it was erratic yeah that it did that it didn't like drift peacefully yeah, that it Bob... makes it makes me feel like it wasn't a traditional craft like yeah. that's not what they were seeing and the fact that it's hazy it could have even been technology that we don't currently understand like we're saying drones in the way that we would yeah we us humans would have drones it could have been like a excellent hologram mm-hmm. i know we joked about not having 1080 but I think they were beyond 4K even in the 70s, these aliens. I'm yeah. saying for us, it doesn't make sense. But for them, they might have had, like I joked with the laser pointer, but it really could have been not physical. Kind of like, I know mm-hmm. I said we wouldn't talk about these, but we're like the guy ran into the aliens and they disappeared. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying about being interdimensional mm-hmm. and these lights, like maybe they weren't even physical. Maybe they were and it was odd in our atmosphere and that's why it was at that 45 degree angle and it just felt off. So let me ask you about this, and I want to get your opinion on this. I'm leaning on you heavily for this, because you are the ufologist in training at Believing the Bizarre. Everybody felt very chill. It's playful. It's fun. It's mischievous. It's mischievous. Do you believe that, or do you think... There's three sides. Do you believe it, and it being true? Do you think it made them feel that way, or do you think it had no... It just existed, and that's just what what people came to feel about it? I think... The aliens had no agenda, and I think people put their own spin on it because it wasn't actively, like, attacking them. Yeah, anything that doesn't attack you is just playful. Yeah, I think I think the aliens had... Forgive me for saying aliens. If it was aliens, I think they had no agenda. Yeah, they were just in the area. But so consistent, and it almost felt like putting on a light show, like like a circus. And yeah. maybe it's funny, like, because we don't know what their intent was. Yeah, exactly. Charlie Red Star's intent. Okay, well, then this this kind of gets down to it. Do you find 
Charlie, Red Star, and all these encounters believable or viable. I wish I or would. skeptical. <laughs> I wish there'd be more photos for how consistent it was. Yeah. But it is in the 70s. You have to, like, set up a whole tripod and, like, a a, a whole booth. I don't know that they took pictures <laughs> in the 70s. What's interesting to me about it is that it's not more well-known, but I think that's just how things are in different cultures. It's small-town Canada, though. It's small, but I feel like it should even be bigger in Canada. But I'm thinking, one, that it's not United States. I feel like, not to mm-hmm. insult anybody, but I feel like United States folks are a little ignorant sometimes to things that happen outside our borders. Yeah. I'm guilty of it. Same. So I think maybe that's why. But I agree. I think it's the fact that it wasn't United States based, but also the fact that it was so rural. But it it seems like it was bumping for those two years. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt real for those two years for those people. I want to give it a viable because of all the collaboration and the witnesses and Mm -hmm. the nuclear theory. I think a lot of that makes a lot of sense and falls into UFO lore. Yeah. It's really neat. The alien descriptions really creep me out. Like, really creep me out. I wish I'd like to see more, like, physical proof. Like, I got this picture. I got this video. That was actually in my notes. My notes say, a little peek behind the curtain. Says, even though this is in the 70s, do you think there should be more evidence? I do. Yeah. JFK was assassinated, and they got a video of that. In the words of the guy that tried to start his car, F*** it. I'm going believable. I think, even if it's not alien, even if it's not alien... Even if it was government, even if it had something to do with the nuclear facility, maybe it was something just distracting the people in the area from things happening at the nuclear facility. Oh, like magic. Like, look over here. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know the intent. Nobody ever will. I do believe that people in this area, in this rural section of Canada, were seeing a red light in the sky. Whether it was human, alien, weird technology... A conspiracy, I don't know. But I do think it was real. I go believable. So that is our story on Charlie Red Star. Now, you said maybe it'll kind of, you know, shake in your brain noggin and you'll remember some stuff. Is this completely new to you? I've never heard of this. Me either, man. It, It seems like it should be bigger. I'll be interested to see if some of our listeners are familiar. I'm glad I get to learn about a new UFO thing. I'm glad that probably for the first and last time in my life, I was able to teach you something and teach myself (laughs) something. You've taught me plenty. You've taught me plenty. All right. So for the next two minutes, I'm just going to name every episode I haven't named thus far. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But what you should do is if you're enjoying the podcast, you should. And if you have an Apple device, if you're on Android, that's fine. You got Google Pay and all that cool stuff. And I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about Androids. I've never had it. I'm kind of, I'm team Apple. I'm just going to be up front. Are you on my side now? Yes. Good man. If you have an Apple device, like an iPhone, and you're enjoying the podcast and you want to let us know about it, go to Believe in the Bazaar and leave us a five-star review and tell us, say your thoughts, we'll screenshot it, we'll put in our Instagram stories, other people will see it, everybody will feel good. And if you don't have an Apple device and you still want to let us know, please hit us up in our DMs. We love to hear from you guys. We like to talk to you about the stuff. We love topic suggestions. So please, we love the engagement. Please feel free to hit us up. And I want to mention something we have not mentioned for a, a good while. If you like the show, you're like, I love the show. I want to represent it while I'm out in public. We have hoodies and shirts on display at our store. And a lot of them are really, really cool. Oh, yeah. Go to believeinthebazaar.com. Go to, I think it's just merch. You'll find it. You can go to our Instagram, go to that bio. You'll find it. If you search far enough and wide enough, you will find our If you're really interested, you'll find some really cool shirts from us. Just speaking of this, shout out our listener and patron, Alex. He's always representing us with different... He's just got a hoodie. He's got a couple different shirts. Obviously, he's got the Patreon exclusive shirt. So shout out Alex for always representing us. Yeah, and he looks better in those than we ever will. Yes, 100%. (laughs) So thank you. And again... Seriously, thank you everybody so much for listening. We appreciate it. It inspires us every single week to put out the best show we possibly can. We don't always hit it, but we mostly do. (laughs) But seriously, thank you all so much. As always, I'm Tyler. And I'm Charlie. And catch us next week on Believing the Bizarre. The podcast, as bizarre as you are.
boom, boom. It's aliens? Yeah. Again? Dude, it's been six episodes. What? Really? It's been six episodes. Taking all these alien episodes. You keep doing cryptids. You keep doing mans, <laughs> man. I do. You do this man. You do that man. <laughs> Charlie's just doing all the men. I am. <laughs> Keeps doing them. <laughs> Well, you got me. <laughs> you know when we were naming all of them, we never actually named Mothman? Oh, yeah, him too. Yeah. <laughs> I do them all. I do all them men. 